Hey, uh, good afternoon to everyone. I am uh, Dr. Enrique Manzano, and I'm here with Dr. Maria Carla Manzano to present our paper, the non-invasive real-time blood glucometer using the 1550 nanometer near-infrared light-emitting diode transmitter receiver pair. Cater to more of a uh, who's trying to to make themselves uh, wet in material science. I'm going to low, lower the level of uh, of uh, of presentation so it will cater to them. Okay, so you might be wondering why a blood uh, glucometer will be uh, uh, published in a journal in material science. Too many material science would be trying to find many materials or exotic materials that will cater to new applications. However, there's still one more area that really needs a lot of study. And these are existing materials that you try to find now exciting properties never been discovered so that it will lead to uh, a, a new application. So in this study, did we start with material and try to study further its material characteristics? Actually, no, we didn't start with that. We started with a problem. So we all know that material science and materials engineering really work hand in hand. Sometimes the problem occurs first, then you try to search for the solution. And of course, materials that will uh, cater to that uh, uh, problem. So we started with a problem. What problem is that? That is the blood glucometer. So we have a problem of, uh, of measuring the blood glucose level. Uh, a problem which the uh, by 2030 will reach now 0.7 billion people having uh, diabetes worldwide. So in conjunction with the uh, Agenda 2030, which is an agenda of the United Nations, and one of its SDGs or Sustainable Development Goals is in health. We 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 uh, concerted our effort in trying to find a solution by which we can monitor this uh, blood glucose not invasively and at a very low cost, so that many people can manage their diabetes. So why non-invasive? Non-invasive because people are afraid to prick their fingers in the present way of getting the blood glucose using a uh, blood glucometer, which re requires you to prick your finger, get a blood sample and measure the, the endometer measuring that blood sample. So among those uh, non-invasive methods, actually there are many. This includes Raman spectroscopy, microwave, uh, photoacoustic methods, uh, fluorescence, uh, uh, getting samples of the saliva, getting a sample of your sweat, and of course your breath. Now, our group is uh, involved in, in at least three of these methods, actually four. Uh, that is getting the saliva, getting the sweat, and getting the breath for a breath analyzer to measure the blood uh, glucose level. But of course, there are really a lot of problems here. For instance, these COVID times, we are scared of uh, measuring the uh, blood glucometer using a breath analyzer because who would like to share breath, uh, breath uh, analyzer? So this is going to be very expensive even for saliva and for the sweat. So a cheaper method to do this is using a uh, LED-based uh, blood glucometer. You are well aware of the pulse oximeter. The pulse oximeter can measure the uh, saturation of oxygen in your blood using LEDs. So uh, that that uh, gadget is simply clipped onto one of your fingers and in a few seconds you will already have the uh, SpO2 level. 
Now that is very very important because even before, no, before this pulse oximeter was invented, even a doctor which is already well uh, versed in trying to measure the, uh, or trying to uh, to get a gauge of the uh, uh, the the oxygen level of your blood, he won't be able to do it with a, even a naked eye. Even if your your SpO2 level will fall down to eighty percent. Uh, even a very good doctor will not be able to determine that your oxygen level is already very low. So therefore, the the pulse oximeter is very very important. So we're trying to develop a uh, a uh, so uh, blood uh, uh, glucose monitoring system that is path pattern after the methodology of the pulse oximeter. Now this follows the uh, the uh, research uh, which was published in the same journal in 2019, but uses a different uh, spectra spectrum. Uh, this one uses now the 50-50 nanometer. You might ask, why should you have another spectrum again when the earlier spectrum at 940 nanometers was already showing good results? Now, if you observe the pulse oximeter carefully, you will see that it is not only one LED. There are actually two LEDs in the pulse oximeter. The first LED is a six, 660 nanometers and the second one at 940 nanometers. Although you will only see one color and that is the red one because the other one is actually infrared. So if you look at a modern pulse oximeter, you will be only be able to detect one LED, pero actually dalawa. It's the same thing now for the blood glucometer. We've already tested one uh, wavelength and we're now testing uh, another wave. Actually, we have tested already many, many more, but we are only uh, 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 reporting the results for the second one. So we, you will see that sometimes the one will uh, be better than the other. And very importantly, sana, no? You would hope that the behavior is going to be different because if the the, 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 the behaviors are different, you will come up with a uh, more accurate uh, monitoring system. Okay, so what type, uh, what material are we trying to study? The material that we are trying to study is a semiconductor. Now, LEDs are composed of semiconductors and that property will be optical and uh, electrical. Optical, because, well, if you are going to, to describe a semiconductor, we do it with an uh, energy diagram. In that energy diagram, uh, uh, it is composed of a valence band, a conduct, conduction band, sorry, and an energy gap. Now, the energy gap will give you, uh, which is equal to HF or the Planck's constant times the frequency, the frequency of the light that it can emit and the frequency of light that it can absorb. So basically, it will have to be the same because the energy gap will be uh, the same. Now, we are also working with conducting polymers and only the difference is that, well, we are just simply working with different charge carriers. So for semiconductors, like for our research here, we're just dealing with electron hole pairs for for conducting polymers we're working with uh, with uh, polarons and bipolarons and of course for other uh, sem non semiconductor based semiconductors you'll be looking at solitons and so on and instead of looking at the uh, valence band and conduction band we're looking at lumos and humos but the property is the same what property is that? That that material will emit a certain frequency of light, and that material will respond to exactly that same frequency of light. So we are hoping to get uh, to take advantage of the optical properties of of uh, biomaterials. For example, DNA and DNA and protein will absorb. Uh, ultraviolet light very readily. Readily, hemoglobin will absorb visible light readily, 
and water, which makes up 70% of our body, will absorb infrared red readily. Now, its absorption of, of infrared will not be constant throughout the entire spectra. There will be some peaks and valleys. And the peaks there would be for water, for instance, the first peak will be at 1350 nanometer to 1520 nanometers. And the second peak will be at 70 nanometers to 2000 nanometers. Now we have observed that blood glucose will uh, respond to infrared better. So we have uh, found we found out that it will uh, respond to uh, infrared in three regions. The first region is 700 to 1100 nanometers. That was our first research we published in 2019. Our infrared LED was in that region. The second region is 1500 to 15, so sorry, to 1850 nanometers. That is now the research I am presenting now at a wavelength of 1550 nanometer. And of course, the last one will be at 2000 to 24. Uh, 2400 nanometer. Of course, within that region, you just cannot choose within uh, any frequency in the region. Like for instance, in the 1500 to 1850 nanometers, you cannot just choose any uh, wavelength. Why not? Because you have to choose wavelengths which are available in the market. Okay, It has to be available because you want it to be low cost. You don't want to de de develop something new and that will cost you millions or probably even billions of pesos just to create that particular frequency. And that is why we have chosen 1550 nanometer because it is commercially available. Okay, so we are trying to, under material science, we're trying to observe the, uh, the, uh, the optical property of the... Uh, of the material in conjunction with the optical property of the LED. Okay, so in the, the methodology you will see in your diagram, there are two LEDs there. This is called a transmitter and receiver pair. Why do you want a receiver pair? You want a receiver pair because the light emitted by one must be exactly the same narrow band frequency detected by the receiver. If you, it doesn't do that, then it's going to be useless. Furthermore, there are many noise, there are several noise available. For instance, light can emit infrared. The sunlight has several components of infrared. You don't want the receiver to be measuring the noise or the light coming from other sources. You want that receiver to measure specifically the light emitted by the transmitter of the system. And that is very, very critical. Another problem there is to make sure that your receiver is low cost because receivers are very, very expensive. The transmitter is, is uh, cheap, is inexpensive, but the receivers are very, very expensive. Now, and of course, the receiver can be very, very uh, wide band, not, not narrow band, so it can detect a range of frequencies. So why does make uh, make our system very nice? Because they are both narrow band and we are sure, absolutely sure, that the frequencies emitted by the transmitters are the exact same frequencies received by the receiver. Of course, now you see in this diagram, this is not, uh, it's already, general it doesn't give you the specifics of course uh, research is very expensive and we try to keep a lot of the the sensitive materials uh, uh, or, or information not easily available but i can tell you that for the transmitter the transmitter simply lights up the led which is at 1550 nanometers wavelength which is infrared at a very uh, solid uh, uh, or steady uh, light because too strong will uh, emit too many photons, too weak, too less photons. So you want to have 
the emittance of photons as a steady phase. And what dictates that will be the uh, junction uh, voltage across the PN junction of the diode. So if you can keep this constant, then you can be more or less that the number of photons emitted uh, by the LED, assuming that you have a uh, uh, standard temperature and pressure, will be constant. So I can also tell you that in order to do that, uh, we need a uh, an amplifier. Then we need a uh, generator, a signal generator, operating a at a uh, CW mode in order to achieve that uh, stability. On the other side, we have a uh, a uh, receiver. So the receiver now is more is actually very very crucial. The angle of the receiver is very crucial because if it's not properly aligned to the transmitter, you will not get optimum results. Also, the receiver. I can tell you that much that it is uh, uh, operated in the reverse bias bias mode. And uh, we need op-amps in order to stabilize the uh, the gain of the of the receiver because if the bias or the gain will not be held constant, even a very, very small difference of gain, let's say from uh, uh, from 2.0 to 2.1, that point one will make a very, very big difference in the result. So you have to make sure that your system must ensure that the gain, okay, usually measured in dB, will be constant. Otherwise, your result will not be consistent. Also, the uh, manner by which you take the measurement must be, uh, is also very critical to get the proper accuracy. If you're an instrumentalist, you will know, for instance, if you want to measure the speed of a merry-go-round, how long does it take to do one round? So if you do uh, just one measurement with your timer, maybe your measurement will come within one second error. But if you do the same measurement, but you count now 10 rotations and you divide it by 10, then your, your measurement is still using the same, exactly the same system, will now be more accurate, or sorry, more precise with the precision of point, maybe in the tenth of a second. Doing it a hundred times will give you now a precision within a hundred. Okay, so there's also a, uh, a uh, hint here that you have to use instrumentation, not only to uh, signal condition, do the signal conditioning, but you must make sure that your measurement is as precise and repeatable as possible. And of course, uh, when you do measurement, you have to know of your uh, response time. Okay, you just, just can't measure any time that you like, but you have to deal with the response time. And our system uh, showed a response time of 40 seconds. In other words, it takes 40 seconds for the reading to stabilize and to be uh, uh, representative of the blood glucose level of the system. Between the two LEDs is now the phantom thing, finger. So that is supposed to be your finger. But because uh, uh, we're still doing the uh, basic legwork, we're using a phantom finger. That's what we call a fam phantom finger, a fancy name for simply a cuvette. So it's just simply a vial, which is a uh, uh, rectangular in shape, and that is where we, uh, we place the blood glucose or the blood sample. Now, we didn't actually use a blood sample. What we use is actually a, a uh, control uh, a control uh, solution, which is bought in, uh, say, mercury. No? Now, when you calibrate your, your blood monitoring, mon monitoring system, you need these control solutions. Even the hospital uses the exact same uh, solutions to calibrate their laboratory blood uh, glucose uh, measuring system. And of course, the home measuring sh systems are 
calibrated according to that. But very, very few households will ever uh, try to calibrate their blood uh, monitoring system because one, they don't know how, and second, it's very expensive. Uh, uh, control solutions are quite expensive. So essentially what we do, there are three uh, blood uh, control uh, solutions, no? blood glucose control solutions, low in the mid and the high. Yun ang binibigay nila, wala nang nabibenta besides that. They will only uh, send, uh, sell you three. One is low, the other one is normal, and the other one is high. Maybe 50, then 120, then 300. And of course, they will not guarantee the the actual value. Let's say the low will be 50, but we will get maybe 51, 48, etc. It's not going to be guaranteed with that value, but it is guaranteed to be low. And of course, there's an expir expiration date. And beyond that, they cannot already uh, say that the uh, the uh, solution is uh, uh, acceptable at that. Okay, so that's our system, our our uh, our simple system. I say simple because the block diagram is simple, but actually the the details there are are very very uh, are very uh, difficult. By the way. Uh, uh, not shown, uh, sorry, shown in this diagram is a box around the uh, around the cuvette. Actually, hindi lang yung simple box, kundi it says there, Faraday cage. The Faraday cage, as you might know, for those who don't know, if you place a, a uh, completely metal enclosure around your system, no EM wave can go in, no EM wave can get out. So that is why it will protect the measurement uh, with the uh, external uh, light coming in. So we try to minimize noise as much as possible. If you notice that if you're inside an elevator, sometimes your cell phone doesn't work. It is for elevators that are completely metal. If they're completely metal, then there's no signal coming from Snomart or Globe. Or if you want, you put your phone inside a, uh, a foil, like a a uh, a uh, uh, support ng uh, uh, chips no as foil and if you close the chip then no signal goes in no signal goes out okay so if you look our uh, response time the uh, response for every measure is something shown in the curve it's a, it uh, it starts at some value doesn't really matter what that is it can be high it can be low it depends, but it will try, it will now uh, stabilize and you will get a stabilized output somewhere after 40 seconds. Here in this diagram here, it is closer to 30, but we are taking 40 seconds because that is what is shown by the low, uh, normal, and high. So it's about 40 seconds. That was clearly observed. And after 40 seconds, we can now get a reading and besides some other procedures for for uh, signal conditioning, we try to get as many uh, measurements as we can in order to to uh, uh, to minimize the error using a very simple average. Okay, so these are the results. So you will see that there are only three. Uh, control solutions, the low, the normal, and the high. But looking at their measurements, you will clearly see that the <clears throat> sorry, the precision is very high. How do I know visually that the precision is high? The precision is high when the dots are close together. Just like when you hit a bullseye with your arrow, if your arrows fall very close to each other, never mind if they're not close to the center, for as long as they fall, are very close together, then you are a very precise shooter. And if you uh, fire at the center, close to the center, then you are a very accurate shooter. So here it says now the system is very quite uh, precise because the dots are very close, close together. 
especially for the normal, very, very close. So if we, we look at the trend line, no? comparing the measurement of our system compared to that to a standard blood glucometer, okay, whose value is uh, shown on the y-axis, then we see that it is a very, very linear relationship. How do I know that? Because the uh, the uh, coefficient of determination uh, is a uh, point uh, eight, sorry, point nine seven five five or R squared. So uh, the coefficient of determination tells you whether the re relationship is very linear or not. So point nine uh, seven five five is already very very close to one, showing you that the uh, relationship is very linear with an equation of blood concentration equal to 5,000 times the voltage minus 4043. Okay, with a, uh, a uh, sensitivity of 2 millivolts per 10 milligram per deciliter. Now, showing the correlation between the two, the Pearson coefficient of correlation is point. 9877. Statisticians will consider a uh, Pearson coefficient of uh, co uh, correlation of 0.7 to be high, and ours is very, very high at 0.99% uh, or 99%. So, this is very promising for a uh, uh, narrow bandwidth of 1550 nanometers, which is readily available in the uh, market. To give a, 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 an accurate measurement of the accuracy, instead of measuring it, uh, of course, we can do the normal measurements in instrumentation, but a very uh, better uh, standard gauge for accuracy is the Clark error grid analysis. Now, in this grid analysis, you would like to have your measurements in region A. If they are confined in region A, then you will say that it is highly accurate. So B, if they fall in B, then not so accurate. And C, well, or D, uh, you need to have more improvements. We'll see that 14 of our measurements fall in region A, and there's only one measurement, uh, which is actually really close to region A. So conclusion there is that it is quite uh, accurate. Okay. So for the conclusion, <laughs> okay, so Sorry for that, major technical problem. So for the conclusion, we can say that we have observed a uh, a new characteristic of our of our LED of uh, 50, 50 uh, uh, nanometer. It is uh, good for blood glucose uh, measurement, uh, non-invasive and real time. Uh, we can. Uh, take advantage of the narrow bandwidth and its absorption characteristics with the blood glucose. Of course, in our blood, the glucose in our blood, and it can accurately give us a measurement of the uh, blood of the blood glucose level of uh, of our fluid inside the body. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Ricky Mansano. Are there any questions from the uh, audience? You may type your questions in the chat box. Pwede siguro, is it possible if they just, uh, uh, you may ask me, are we very close to making a uh, prototype of a uh, blood glucometer? Uh, answer is that 
actually we already built an Arduino based blood glucometer uh, using this one. Uh, this was successful, but we're trying to uh, to to make it uh, more accurate and lower the uh, cost. And of course, clinical trials must be there because you just cannot use phantom fingers. We have actually used already uh, uh, real real uh, uh, fingers or actually actual measurement already before uh, making a prototype. Thank you, Dr. Ricky. Okay. How about uh, Gentleson? Do you have any questions? Your mic is open. Gentleson? If you have a question, uh, yeah. Ibang ways, method, uh, not as promising as the LED. We have tried the saliva. Uh, puede. Uh, sweat. Uh, we've tried to uh, use the breath analyzer uh, the pollen dump, uh, conducting polymer uh, still trying to figure out but among the the candidates here it is the LED pair that is most promising okay. Thank you, uh, Dr. Mansano. Thank you. Would you like to continue? The next presentation is uh, on capacitance or that will be Dr. Carla? Dr. Carla will. Uh, yes. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, you may. A few minutes to, a few minutes to uh, open my PowerPoint presentation. Okay, so maybe I can still ask questions from the audience. You can type your questions in the chat box. Or use the mic. Or you can use the mic because the, the mic the of letters gen... are very small. Eh? Oh. The letters are so small. Actually, I am thankful that you published your results in the journal because this is a, a very emerging technology and that uh, imagine uh, you don't need to prick anymore the hands of the patient to get blood. Huh? All you need is just an LED. But if this is uh, supposed to be uh, working, will it be... Uh, in the skin, or what, what? What is the intention of the technology? Exactly like that of a pulse oximeter. Mm. You just clip the gadget near to your finger. Yes, uh, that is exactly uh, the same. Exactly the same. Okay. It's going to be cheap because pulse oximeters are like sixty-five pesos for the low end yeah. and seven hundred for the high end. Oh, Arturo has a question. Is is this open for commercialization in the future so that public can easily access this kind of technology? Yes, we try to commercialize it. That's our final objective. Because we want uh, people to, uh, to be able to use it to help them in their management of diabetes. So we are going to commercialize it. Thank you, Art, for that question. There's another question by Samuel. Is the prototype still getting accurate results after considering factors relating to the patient's skin type? Like, is the prototype robust if there are substances in the skin? Uh, we are still doing the clinical trials. So we're going to analyze the data. I am very sure that there's still a lot of problems that will come out. That's his skin, eh? <laughs> yes. Oh, yeah. so, but we I found a way to, to go around it. We found the way. It's not the same, same for everyone, but we found a way to go around that problem. But but if it is if this is for rapid diagnosis, diagnosis, rapid, no, uh, of course there's yeah. no substitute for uh, actual laboratory within, tests. Within but 40 seconds. 
uh, at least uh, you can uh, already prevent no prevent the important thing is prevention eh rather than whether yeah. your blood glucose level yeah. is really high already yeah. within normal range or very low mm -hmm. so that is what's important naman no for mm -hmm. for home no for home uh, blood glucose monitoring Okay, so I think you're ready with your uh, next presentation. Okay, you may start your presentation, Doc Harla. Uh, 